Hello there, everyone, and welcome to another Data Masker Head Scratcher. Now, today, I've got an absolute doozy for you in retaining data distribution. A very interesting subject, and we're not just talking statistical distribution, but it could be distribution of any data used for any kind of analysis purposes. As always, my name is Chris Unwin, and I'm a solution architect here at Redgate Software. So the first problem that we're going to start out with today, and we have three problems, the rule of three, I like a group of three as well. Number one is numeric or money columns, anything that holds some kind of financial value. Now, I've got my copy of the DM database available right here. And if you take a look over on the left hand side, you'll notice that we've got uh, some of the figures being pulled from the DM employee table. Now, this particular, uh, this particular database is available on my GitHub. It's actually the DM test database. Now, the, uh, this particular table and in fact the customer table have been modified ever so slightly. To the employee table, I have added the salary column and it added that information. And the same over on the customer table, I've added the customer date of birth column and populated it with some, uh, some example values. So let's talk about money not the most comfortable subject, but you'll notice that right here in the employee table, we have the employee salary. And this is, you know, this ranges from uh, a number of values. Let's just re-execute this query here and double check. Uh, you'll see over here, we've got the minimum salary is 12,567.15 pounds. Let's go with pounds. And the max is 74,382 pounds with an average of 41,753 for all of our employees. Now, let's say we needed to do some analysis of these figures, but of course, the figures themselves are not directly sensitive. They are a sensitive piece of information when combined with the other values, and we would assume that we would be masking the first name, the last name, the employee ID. Now, for masking the employee ID, because that's a key, it's not necessarily easily tied back unless you have a helpful person ID, check out the primary and foreign key masking video on Redgate University that will walk you through using a synchronization manager to mask those values in that and other tables. For now, though, we just care about that salary. Now, the way that we're going to do this, and I've set up a, a masking set for this as well with some example rules in for each of our three problems. Now, the first problem is, of course, the number problem. So for this one, I'm using a shuffle rule. Now, by going to new rule, masking shuffle, what we're then able to do is select the column on the left hand side or the select the table, sorry, in this case, DM employee and the column by extension, in this case, salary. Now, by shuffling this particular column, what we'll do is we'll move all of the values to another row somewhere. And it will never, there's, there's safeguards within Data Masker to prevent values from going back into the same row. So we're fine with that, but it will just shuffle them around, which means that each of the hopefully now masked employees will receive a correct salary. It is the salary for someone who works at our company, but we have no way of identifying whose salary that was. So let's go ahead and run that one rule. See if you could say that three times fast. Run that one rule. And if we now jump back into SSMS and take a look. So beforehand, you'll notice that we had a whole bunch of values and now they've actually been changed. So we've still got the values that we had previously, except they're in different, uh, they're in uh, different rows, but the min salary, max salary and average salary, you'll notice have not changed. We have retained the spread. We have the same minimum, the same maximum, the same average because the values are still the same, but because they're now tied to a row that is not their correct row, even with the un even with the unmasked names, for instance, I would still find it difficult to tie salaries back to individuals. Of course, we would naturally go a step further and mask the names as well. So that's the shuffle rule helping us with the numeric or money problem. 
Problem number two, dates. And no, I'm not talking about the small fruits, uh, although I'm a big fan of dates, actually. You can make a very nice salted caramel with them. But what we're talking about specifically is dates or date times stored in SQL Server. A good example of this being uh, the dates over here on customer date of birth. Now, if we zoom in here, uh, hopefully we'll be able to uh, hopefully we'll be able to see. So we've got the customer date of birth, and as you can see, we've got a whole range of different values. And the minimum date is 1981, in fact, the 27th of September, 1981. The max date is the 11th of June, 2002. And generally, the middle date is about 1992, the, uh, the 10th of June, 1992. So how are we going to mask these values? Now, a date of birth, unlike the money column that we were talking about, whilst it could be shuffled, the date of birth is slightly easier to tie back to individuals uh, with other identifying information. So this is something we're definitely going to have to change. In some cases where you do, you absolutely need to process the real dates of birth for, um, you know, in a justifiable way, i.e. you need to process it in order to provide the service to your customers, then of course you might just want to shuffle them around. In this case, though, we are actually going to change them slightly. And we're going to do so using a second rule in Data Masker, the substitution rule. Now, the substitution rule is actually going to allow us to use a data set that we call the date variance random set. Now, the date variance random set is going to allow us to specify a low bound and a high bound for these dates, and also that zero is not a valid variance. And effectively, this is going to go through each of those values and vary it up to 60 days either side, but randomly. We don't know what that tolerance is. It could be plus 45. It could be negative 12 days. Really, no one can tell because it is random. Now, the good thing about this is that if we do run this particular one, if I run it like this, and we jump back into SSMS. So you'll notice that Mamie Ferno originally had an 18th of January 2002 date of birth. Now, if we rerun that, and actually keep an eye on the min date and max date as well. So we've got min date September 1981 and June 2002 for the max date. If we now re-execute this query, you'll notice we're still, we were so close. So 1981 still, 2002 still. But everything has shifted ever so slightly. Uh, Mamie's date of birth has changed. The mid-date is still roughly where it should have been. It was in uh, June 1992. So all of that distribution has stayed roughly the same, but it has allowed us to actually mask within a tolerance. So we can still carry out analysis on these dates of birth. And of course, if you wanted to shuffle them afterwards as well, mask them like this, then shuffle them, then there's absolutely nothing stopping you from using the substitution rule for that column with the date variance and then tagging a shuffle rule on to the back end as well. So that was number two. So what's problem number three then, the final one for today? Uh, problem number three is address masking. So we've talked about kind of numeric values so far. We've talked about you know dates of birth, they can be changed, money amounts, they can be changed, they can also be shuffled. Um, but what about retaining realistic address data? Well, address is probably one of the hardest of all of the sensitive information for us to mask because we want the data to be indicative of where our customers live. Maybe we're carrying out some kind of cluster analysis. We want to figure out where our services are most used, where our customers are based, all of these sorts of purposes. But if we have the postcode and the street address and the region of the person, all I need really is the last name and I can tie it back incredibly easily. Or the street address, that would be ideal, that I know exactly where they live. <laughs> So what we're going to do is if we jump back into Management Studio, you'll notice that we have some address details here for Mamie Ferno. We've got 40 Schnepp View, West Yorkshire, and then we've got BB50QL, which is uh, a postcode obviously in West Yorkshire. 
Now, let's say that actually the best way of carrying out some analysis would be to know generally that our customers exist within that particular postcode. We have uh, quite a few customers who want to carry out analysis on the zip code, the postal code. And actually, the easiest way to do that is to take a part of it. You know, BD50QL, the BD5 is probably the most useful piece because it takes you down to a smaller subset, a smaller region within your set of data, but without zooming into the exact street, for instance. And you can do this same kind of thinking and methodology with zip codes as well. So realistically, what needs to be masked here is the entire street address. We don't care about the street address because we're generalizing to a region. So we can completely mask that street address. And then once we've done that, we know that we've got the postcode and the region correctly. So we can leave the region as they are. And what I can then do is in fact, just take the first portion of the zip code and then replace the last portion with some random characters. That way, we know that that row is generally in West Yorkshire, generally around the BD5 area, but it's still not enough for us to go on, especially when we trade all over the UK. So fortunately, in Data Masker, I've got two rules to do this particular process. The first is actually the substitution rule, which will mask the street address. Once the street address has been masked, of course, and only once the street address has been masked, because even if we mask the postcode, even if we get rid of the last few digits, we're still going to end up, if we haven't masked the street address, you'd still be able to f find that individual. So we wait for that particular field to be masked. And only once that has completed, we then run a row internal synchronization rule over the uh, customer zip code field. Now, exactly what's going on here, you'll know from the videos on Redgate University that we can actually put T-SQL in these row internal sync rules. Now, that means we can have case statements and substrings, whatever we like. And in this particular one, you'll notice I've got the substring of the customer zip code. So I'm substringing it into itself. So the zip code where we had BD5, we've now got BD5 because we're looking just for from one to char index space. Okay, so BD5 space. So we're looking up to that point and we're just chopping out that piece of the postcode. And then we're adding on just some random digits. And in this case, I'm using the text alphanumeric uh, formatted data set with a percentage N and two percentage capital C's, which allows us to generate a number of example uh, kind of number plus two capital letters. So now we might end up with BD5, 6AD, 6ZW, 4UJ. It could really be any of these. Is it directly identifying? No. Of course, what we may wish to do is also, again, shuffle those values around because we are preserving a portion of something that is so sensitive. It may well also make sense for us to say, okay, we have masked all of those values together. It's now time to shuffle them. And fortunately, within a shuffle rule, you can choose multiple columns. So we could preserve the now masked street address with the region with the postcode. OK, and it will shuffle all three of those values into a different row as opposed to then breaking that relationship. So let's go ahead and run those two rules and see what we end up with. So that was successful. So you'll notice that beforehand we had BD5, 0QL, 40 Schnepp view. If we now rerun this query, you'll notice we've now got 43B Dingley Street, still West Yorkshire, but then we've got BD5, 20V. That's not what it was beforehand. We've now realistically masked these address values, but where we're carrying out analysis, say on the first portion of the customer zip code, it will actually help us do that real analysis of our customer data, but of course, protected. So of course, that is how we would tackle those three problems. The first, the numeric money column with a shuffle, 
You can, of course, mask it as well and shuffle it around within a tolerance. It's up to you. The second is those pesky dates or date times. Very easy to mask within a tolerance and shuffle if you would like to. And of course, address masking, making sure we do mask those street addresses, those identifiers, and then of course mask a portion of the postal code. Now again, for something like a zip code, it would be very easy to just take the first four digits and then add some random other numbers and obviously do the analysis on the first portion of the zip code. For now though, thank you very much for stopping by, for watching this video, um, and of course for more wonderful Data Masker videos, check out the other Data Masker head scratchers and the Data Masker course on Redgate University. Thanks for stopping by.